I'd like to apologise to the Lexus RZ450E. You see, I got this car all wrong. I thought it was just going to be a sort of poshed up, rebadged Toyota BZ4X, which is a car that I didn't find terribly exciting. But it's much more than that. And in fact, it's got two pieces of technology which I think are going to be key for all electric cars in the future. So the first part of this video will be all about the tech. If you just want the normal review stuff about charging times, headroom and boot space, then skip forward a few minutes. If you are jumping through, I'll wave my arms about so you can tell where it starts. OK? Oh, but like and subscribe first, please. Still here? Good, because I think a lot of you will find some of this a bit mind-blowing, possibly a little scary too. That's because this Lexus doesn't have a component which has been considered essential since the invention of the car. A steering column. There's no mechanical connection at all between the driver and the wheels. None. This is the first car to have that. Lexus calls it One Motion Grip, or OMG for short, which is quite appropriate really. It's going to be available as an option from 2025, so this really is a glimpse into the future, unless you're watching in 2025, I suppose. This technology raises a lot of questions, such as how and why, quickly followed by what happens if it all goes wrong. So let's deal with the how first. Now, if you've been observant, you'll notice that this is not a steering wheel. It's a yoke, and I've promised not to make a joke about the yoke. Now, I assume that everybody like me will just want to make <laughs> noises and pretend they're on the way to destroy the Death Star, but there are more grown up reasons behind this. Feel the force, Luke. Who's Luke? Oh, and I know Tesla had a yoke on the new Model S and Model X, but that was just a conventional steering system with a funky steering wheel, and the one used in Knight Rider wasn't real either. Sorry, but this is different. The Lexus yoke is connected to sensors and a motor, which then tell another motor down by the wheels what to do via a wire. So the clever part is that the ratio of what happens up here and what happens down at those wheels can change depending on the situation. So if I'm pulling out of a parking space, that's full lock. I don't need to shuffle around the wheel. But if I'm on the motorway, I need a much bigger movement. I've been told it will take me about three minutes to get used to this by one of the car's engineers. So let's see. Now I'm driving down this urban road and there's potholes and manhole covers and speed bumps and none of it is making it through to the wheel. Now I know there's things going on and I don't feel that I'm disconnected from the car, it's just a lot nicer, there are no shocks through my hands. It's very clever. One of the interesting parts of this technology is that there is still feel through the steering. You can tell when there's a change of road surface or you go over a cat's eye. It will also go light if you start to slip, just like with a conventional steering system. But all of that feedback is artificial. It's sensed by monitors down at the wheels and then recreated by the module attached to the yoke. A bit like a computer game, really. One of the reasons Lexus has created this system is because it can filter out what you feel. The desirable feedback makes it to your fingertips. Anything considered unpleasant gets removed making the RZ feel very refined. It can be tuned too, so that you would feel more in a sports car and less in a luxury limo. The RZ is sort of halfway between those two. The system will also sense if the car is being pulled off the intended line by something like a camber in the road and automatically correct it, so you won't have to constantly pull on the wheel or yoke. Now, I've been driving this car for about three minutes now, and they're right, I have got used to it. It does require a little bit of recalibration on your part. And when you go into roundabouts like this, you sometimes find yourself steering a little bit more than perhaps you uh, need to. But you very quickly get used to it. I did catch out the car when it thought I was going a bit quickly into a corner, mind. But again, it's never dangerous. You just move the yoke a little. One of the advantages of it is that you can see the instruments really clearly which isn't the case with the conventionally steered RZ. The stalks for the indicators and the wipers are fixed to the yoke here so that they move when you turn the wheel or yoke. Now that takes some getting used to as well because initially the indicator stalk isn't where you expect it to be. But again, you very quickly get used to it and it's much better having the wipers, for example, there than on a screen that you have to look away from the road to check. Now we need to talk about the elephant in the room, safety. Whenever I mention drive-by-wire to everybody, they say, I don't fancy that much, or what happens if? And I can understand that, but 
kids don't seem to care about it because they're up with the technology. And also, when I mentioned it to the engineer, he said, well, the British Airways Airbus you came on uses fly-by-wire technology, and that's basically the same thing. So that's kind of good enough for me. If I was going to trust any car company to make stuff that doesn't go wrong, it'd be Lexus. But the people who make up laws about this sort of thing demand a bit more than a reputation for reliability. So like the Airbus, there are backup systems. If one motor fails or the power is interrupted, another motor and a separate battery takes over. I can't test it because it's a Lexus, so it won't break without a sledgehammer being involved. Now there's a sticky question of why Lexus has bothered to do this at all. Compared to a conventional steering system, this is 10 kilograms heavier, it costs more money and actually uses a little more energy than normal. But it makes the driving experience much more pleasurable, there's no doubt about that, and gadget lovers will think it's worth the extra few quid just to be able to show off to their friends. And there's no doubt that your kids are going to be impressed and think you're cool. The bigger story will come when cars are designed to have something like OMG from the start. That will mean a lot less engineering for the swap from left to right hand drive, better packaging and better crash test performance too. It will also integrate seamlessly with autonomous driving systems. The engineers reckon it will be on pretty much all new cars in a decade's time for those reasons. OK, so if that's not too much tech for you, let's steer away to something else which has a direct benefit for electric car drivers because it saves energy. Now this one is possibly inspired by the people you see huddled around in pub gardens having cigarettes. Possibly. You see, the Lexus has radiant heaters, a bit like those ones you see outside pubs and restaurants to keep people warm while they feed their nicotine addiction or moan about their partners. Rather than blasting out heat, they radiate infrared waves which warm surfaces rather than the air in the car. On the RZ, they're hidden on these panels, hidden underneath the dashboard here. They don't glow red, and most times you can't feel they're working at all, because if you leave it in auto, the system just works out exactly what you need on both the radiant and seat and steering wheel heaters. If you want to feel it though, you just whack them up manually, and it feels like the front of your trousers are near a bonfire. Unlike a bonfire though, there's no danger of getting scorched if you get too close. The panels sense if something touches them and reduce the heat. Because warming the person rather than the car is more efficient, Lexus boffins say the energy consumption is reduced by around 8% compared to standard climate control systems, which is worth a few miles extra on a cold day. The driver's panel consumes just 70 watts, which is less than an old-fashioned light bulb. Talking of light, one quick last bit of tech talk. You see this glass roof? If it's getting a bit too bright, you just press this button, and now it's cloudy. That means you get more headroom, less weight and fewer rattles in something which slides across. This could mean it's curtains for the blind. OK, so that's enough of the technology and it's time to talk about the rest of the car. So let's bring everyone else back in who's just skipped forward to this bit. So it's time for the signal. Tell them in the comments if you think they've missed out and they should go back and see that bit. OK, here's the signal. Are you back? OK, well, first of all, let's talk about the size because this car is actually much bigger than I thought it was after having seen it in pictures. I do get a little confused with my Lexus models as the names are made up of the leftover letters on a Scrabble board, but this is 4.8 metres long. That's longer than a Tesla Model Y, for example. That means it sits between the mid-size NX and the largest RX SUV in the Lexus lineup. The one dimension that isn't bigger is the height. Join the Club RZ. This is only 1.6 metres tall, which is about the same as a Nissan Qashqai. Now, if you like the raised driving position of an SUV, you might be a little disappointed. Those dimensions are one of the many things the Lexus RZ shares with the Toyota BZ4X, although there are some surprising differences. It has the same battery, 71.4 kWh, of which 64 kWh is usable, but has a more powerful combination of motors. In the RZ they produce a total of 313 horsepower, but the front motor produces 204 of them. That's unusual for a luxury car like this, which would usually have more power at the rear or an equally matched pair. More power means the range is smaller than the Toyota's too, at between 245 and 270 miles. Those figures are also slightly lower than rivals such as the Audi Q8 e-tron and the BMW iX3, but the RZ's efficiency matches or beats them. The smaller 245 mile figure is for RZ's fitted with bigger 20 inch wheels, as they cause more drag. Bear that in mind when you're ordering, as it's a huge difference. Now these wheels look lovely, but you'd feel pretty silly if you got stuck 25 miles from home because you'd run out of charge. 
Still, at least it looked bling while you waited for the tow truck. Lexus has taken measures to make sure the RZ isn't affected by some of the range issues which have blighted the Toyota 2, including new software to open up more of the safety buffer in the battery. I'd better explain that before you glaze over at the mention of battery buffers. You see, Toyota's engineers had been a bit paranoid about leaving the driver stranded, so the BZ4X had around 30 miles of reserve left, even when the range meter said zero. That panicked owners who thought zero meant zero, so Lexus have a 15 mile buffer. I dare you to try it. If you are still fretting about getting home, the RZ features a fourth setting in the drive modes called range, which restricts the performance by switching off the front motor and killing the air conditioning to maximise efficiency. When the battery is empty, you can charge it up to 150 kilowatts at a suitable DC charging point. That's on the slow side these days, but means you can charge to 80% in about half an hour. If you're not too worried about the range, then the Lexus is more than fast enough. Its 0-62 acceleration time of 5.6 seconds is as much as you'd need in the real world, unless you're playing top trumps. Inside, the dashboard and seats are obviously a bit more premium than the Toyota, which one of my colleagues described as being like something from a van. There's all the usual tech you'd expect and a nice balance of physical and touchscreen buttons. Even on the screen, the important ones are always there so you don't have to go through menus to find the heating, for example. There are quite a few buttons which are on the yoke here, but they're intuitive to use and you can set the functions to do what you want them to do. There's also a Mark Levinson premium surround sound system on the top model, which is designed especially for this car. I don't know who Mark Levinson is, but he seems to know his stuff because it sounds great. In the back, there is a reasonable amount of space for up to three passengers, and the boot measures out at 522 litres with the seats up. That's slightly bigger than a BMW iX3 and smaller than the Audi Q8 e-tron. Under the floor is a sizable stash for cables and mucky stuff like wellies. There's no rear wiper though. That's one of my pet hates. Who's responsible for this? What you also notice on these type of roads is that it feels much more refined than you'd expect. So I've driven the lower spec car on 18 inch wheels with the conventional steering and also this version, which is a Takumi top of the range, which has 20 inch wheels and the OMG steering. Now, normally you'd expect the 18 inch wheels to give you a much softer ride and they do slightly. But what you also find is that the twenties aren't as harsh as you'd expect because the steering is filtering out a lot of that roughness that you'd normally get. Now the brakes also feel fine. I mean, they're, they're perfectly strong and you've got lots of regen as well. I can adjust the amount of regen using these paddles and in the maximum, it's almost a one pedal driving car, which I know will please Ginny because she loves that. Generally, this is a very relaxing car to drive. It can go fast, but it's not something it encourages you to do. The RZ is just refined and smooth. It sort of chills you out. Something else I've noticed is that the safety systems, which you need for NCAP ratings these days, are much less obtrusive in this car than you'd expect from a modern car. So there's no harsh tugging into lanes and there's not that many bongs, although there is one which comes on if you break the speed limit, apparently, but I'll never know, obviously. So the only slight issue that's spoiling the refinement is a bit of wind noise from around these mirrors. Now, for some reason, they're huge. Now, I like to be able to see behind me, but I don't quite get why they need to be this big. I'm no fan of the cameras used by some rivals, but since Lexus offers them on some of its other models, it's strange they're not on the RZ. While you um, reflect on that, there's another black fly in the Lexus's Chardonnay, the price. When the RZ arrives in the UK in early summer, the cheapest will cost £62,600 and the most expensive will be £72,100. We all seem to use Tesla as a benchmark and £60,000 will buy you a Model Y performance. And the top versions of the Lexus are overlapping with the Jaguar I-Pace. We all have a tendency to forget that car because it's been around so long, but it can still hold its own against the best. Poor I-Pace. In its defence, the Lexus has a 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty, and the brand's traditionally strong resale values mean the monthly payment should be reasonable. It's likely to cost less per month on a lease or PCP than a Tesla Model Y, for example, even though that car is cheaper. 
So would I recommend that you buy the Lexus RZ over all of the other £70,000 electric SUVs which are vying for your money? Well, it's tricky because on paper it doesn't seem to do anything better. But when you drive it, there's something very relaxing about the Lexus and the way it goes down the road and also the quality. I mean, I'd never tire of hearing that door shut and you know it will keep working like that for years and the dealer will have nice coffee and he'll know your name when you book it in for a service, which for some people would be worth more than say a three second not to 60 time. Now, a lot of you are gonna froth at the mouth and tell me I should just buy a Tesla and knock yourself out in the comments section. But for me, I won't get stressed out because I'll be chilled driving the Lexus.